Well, let's give our attention again to the Word of God. We're reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 17. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. We saw last time that we looked at 1 Peter chapter 2, that when you become a Christian, you become a citizen of God's worldwide eternal kingdom. But we have to ask, uh, how do we live that out? Uh, we're not in heaven yet. So how do we live as part of the kingdom of this world? There are lots of people around us who don't share the same holy values that Peter writes about here in his first letter. Uh, and many of our rulers in this world are not believers either. So how can I live as a, a Christian in an ungodly, in a worldly society? There have been all sorts of reasons for us to ask this in recent days and weeks, as we've thought about uh, the authority that the state has to tell churches what to do, uh, even whether we can meet together in person. Uh, so how can we live as citizens of God's worldwide eternal kingdom and also as citizens of earthly kingdoms too? Well, if you're like me, you'd prefer to have a, a simple list at this point. Uh, ten things you can do and not do while you live in the kingdom of this world. But what God gives us isn't a list. Uh, he gives us instead a principle that we can apply in every situation. And that demands much more thought and, and wisdom on our part. So what's this principle? You see it here in verse 16, live as free people. Okay, well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? But what am I free from? Uh, what am I free to do? Does living as a free person mean that I can ignore what all the authorities of this world say and live however I want to as a Christian? Well, we're going to work through what that freedom is and what it requires of us as we live as citizens of God's kingdom and as citizens of the world. Thankfully, God, through Peter, tells us what this freedom is here, uh, particularly in verse 16. Commonly, we think of freedom as being able to do whatever I like. But that's not quite accurate, is it? Citizens of Australia are free. Uh, we cannot be owned by someone else. But even though we're not slaves, there are still things that we can't do. Uh, there are laws that protect other people's freedom uh, as well as our own safety. And so freedom isn't a, an absolute freedom to do anything. Uh, it's limited in different ways. And we find the same here in God's word. And no sooner does God say in verse 16, live as free people, then he continues, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Your freedom has limits. Christian freedom isn't a license to do whatever you want. You can't say, well, God has saved me by grace. I can ignore the law. <laughs> Look at Matthew 5, 17 to 20 or Romans 6. Or in James chapter 2, where he talks about faith always being accompanied by good works. If you are a Christian, you are free from sin's power and penalty. But that doesn't make you free to do evil. 
That's where Peter starts, isn't it? Come back with me to verse 11, where he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. When you're a Christian, even though, as verse 9 says, you've been called out of darkness into God's wonderful light, you still have sinful desires, just as I do. You're forgiven for sin's penalty, you're free from sin's power, but sin is still present in your heart, where your desires come from. Notice that that's where sin starts, with what you want. It doesn't come only from the outside experiences and pressures and influences on you, your upbringing, your culture, your friends. No, sin starts in the heart with what we want. And that's where our freedom has to begin as well, by abstaining from sinful desires, by distancing ourselves from the things that we want which are sinful. Isn't that what we usually want freedom for, though? To do what isn't allowed? But the desire to be lawless isn't what God has saved you for, Christian. These desires are dangerous. They are not godly. So resist your sinful desires. That's the principle at the heart of our freedom. But how do we do that? How do we resist ungodly desires? Peter tells us here in verses 11 and 12, and again in verse 15. To resist ungodly desires, live like God and do good. See, it's not enough just to resist evil desires. We have to also positively embrace good and godly desires as verse 12 says. But it's not enough just to want what is good either. Uh, we must actually do good to other people, especially when it costs us, as verse 15 reminds us. Uh, we have to live like God does, sacrificially doing good for others. That's what God has done for us, isn't it? that he has given his only son to save everyone who believes in him. And so living as citizens of the kingdom of God means living like God and doing good like God does. Well, again, that sounds very good, but what does it look like? Living like God and doing good looks like submitting yourself as we see in verses 13 and 14. So to submit means to put yourself consciously under someone else's authority. We find here that Christian freedom is freedom from sin, but it's not freedom from responsibility. Uh, we're going to see in the coming weeks how this same application is made for how we live as Christians in the workplace in verses 18 to 25 and as Christians in the home, in chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. But for today, let's focus on what it says about living as Christians in society. And one way, the, the key way that we're to do that, is to submit to each of the authorities over us. We see that in verse 13. A Christian can't say, well, I live in your kingdom, but I'm not going to listen to your rules. Because I'm a citizen of heaven, don't you know? But what if the ruler or the rules are wrong? They're just not evil, uh, but they're not as good as they could have been. Uh, they're not as good as we would have made them. Well, God knows that no one other than himself is perfect. And yet he doesn't give us the right to overrule our rulers. Thankfully, here in the West, uh, we have the right to be able to write to parliamentarians, make submissions to uh, those bodies that make laws, uh, and vote for those who represent us. But in the end, we don't get to choose which rules we follow and which ones we don't. Uh, 
And what if our rulers are not Christians, though? Does that mean that we don't have to listen to them? Well, no. Remember when Peter wrote this, it was almost unimaginable that you would have a ruler who was a believer. And yet, God tells us here to submit to the lawful authority of those who are over us. And that extends not only to those with supreme power, but to those that they appoint as well. Even the really unimportant ones. Notice that in verse 14. We have to obey the people who are there to punish evil doing and commend good. That includes judges, police officers, but also health and safety inspectors, and dare I say it, even parking wardens and council rangers. It's true, our lawmakers and our law enforcement officers might not always be enforcing all of the things that God says they should do. But unless they are stopping us from doing what is good or forcing us to do what is evil, we must submit to them. Even if we think a Christian would have done it differently and made different rules. As Romans 13 reminds us, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. That's the opening verses of Romans 13. So living as free people means submitting our desires to the authorities that God has set in place. But hang on, I mean, why does any of this matter, you might be asking? If I can keep my faith and my citizenship of an earthly kingdom separate, why can't I just do that? Well, we're given two very good reasons here. Because of where you are and because of whose you are. Remember, as a citizen of the kingdom of God living in the kingdom of this world, you're not at home. You're in exile, as verse 11 says. You don't belong here. You're a foreigner, a stranger and an outsider. So you shouldn't blend in. In fact, you are in enemy territory. Notice that in verse 11, your sinful desires are waging war against your soul. You will do real damage to who you are by giving in to your sinful desires. And you're surrounded. Watching you are ignorant fools, as verse 15 says. They don't know God and they don't respect God. And they will accuse you of doing wrong any chance they get, as verse 12 says. Don't give God's enemies any ammunition. That's why you should submit to the authorities who are over you, because of where you are but also because of whose you are. See, even though you're free, you don't belong to yourself. You are God's special possession, as we saw back in verse 9. Well, here in verse 16, it says, Live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. That's why you should submit to the authorities God put over you. Not for their sake, but for the Lord's sake, as verse 13 says. Now, this isn't a call to blind, brainless obedience. No, it's a call to full-hearted obedience, not to men, but to God. Earthly rulers will come and go, but the heavenly ruler is coming again to stay forever. In verse 12 we read that we should live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. At the end, when Jesus comes again, everything will be seen for what it is. 
people who do good stuff and religious stuff, so people will think well of them, will be exposed as the hypocrites that they are. But genuine, loving service, not seeking recognition or reward, will bring glory to God on that day. This world is not your home. You belong to the coming king. So what are you doing for God's glory when he comes again? How are you doing at that? What are you using your freedom for? For those of us looking from the outside, uh, actions can be very hard to interpret. But God knows the desires of your heart. So are you a self-pleasing rebel, uh, using Christianity as a cover for the evil things you would really want to do? Or are you a humble servant of the living and reigning God? A few moments of self-examination will immediately reveal some ways that we're still living as self-pleasing rebels. But if nothing specific is coming to mind right now, please just pause the video for a few minutes. Take some time to think about it and to pray about it now. And even if God is already immediately revealing obvious ways where you need to grow in humility and an obedience to the authorities he's put in your life, please do put some time aside later today to read through this passage again, to think about it and pray about it some more. See, sin has such deep roots in our hearts. We need to think about how we can live as free people. Is it even really possible? Since we still have those sinful desires in our hearts, what deeper motivations can we turn to to drive us to live godly lives of submission? Well, there are two foundational motivations that drive all human relationships. They're love and respect. And we see them both here in verse 17. Well, love and respect are foundational for marriage and family relationships, but they matter for our life in society too. Peter sums up this whole passage in verse 17 like this. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. So we should always start with respect towards anyone that we meet. Don't start by treating people with suspicion. Don't expect them to have to prove themselves to you. No, give them a fair go. Start with respect. But there also has to be love too. If you're a believer, you must love the other members of the family of believers. Now, notice this isn't about everyone having to like you or be liked by you. No, love is bigger than that. Love is sacrificing your desires, putting aside your preferences for the good of other Christians. And even deeper than that is a respect for God. Uh, to fear God here means to value him more than valuing what you want. And so it's here in this context of respecting God that we're told to honour the emperor, the authority figures in the kingdom of this world. As we've said before, a Christian isn't to be a blind follower of the state or a worshipper of political power. Our obedience in the kingdom of this world takes second place behind our obedience in the kingdom of God. But it's also driven by our respect for God and the authorities that he has put in place. So what do you respect and who do you love? What are you doing with your Christian freedom? Are you using it to indulge your sinful desires? 
to rebel against the authorities God has put in your life, to shirk the responsibilities he's given to you? Or are you using your freedom to live like God and to do good? That's always something we should ask ourselves because God knows our hearts. He knows our desires and he is coming. Being a citizen of his kingdom means living in love and respect in the kingdom of this world. So if you want to be free, humble yourself. Well, we all need God's help to be able to do that. So let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your sacrificial love for us. You are great and mighty and could demand everything from us. And yet you give your son to take away our sin, to make us part of the family of believers. And so you call us to live lives of humility, of love and respect towards others. Help us to submit to the authorities that you place in our lives and to meet the responsibilities that you give to us in our different positions. We pray, our Father, that those who observe our lives would have no reason to denigrate Christians because of the way we live. Instead, help us to submit our desires and our actions for the good of others and to bring praise and glory to you on the day when the Lord Jesus returns to reign forever. Our Father, we need your help, and so we thank you for the Holy Spirit who you give to all who believe in you. We pray that he would continue to show us the ways we live as rebels against you and against the rulers that you set up in our lives. And so we pray that you would transform us and help us to live for your glory, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we conclude our time of worship together, well, as we conclude this time of worship, let's hear God's words of blessing for us. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>